right, so here we go. This is uh, Art 11, Beginning Sculpture at Fresno City College, um, Caleb Duarte. Um, we've been doing pretty well so far this semester before the, the COVID-19 took shape and sending us all um, home for a little bit of social responsibility to one another, right? Um, and so uh, we're, I'm new at this, at this video stuff, and we're going to try to uh, be a little bit creative in how we're going to uh, continue with the semester and how we're going to meet our student um, learning outcomes, how we're going to meet our objectives from our syllabus from the beginning of the course, right, uh, with without having to leave our home. So um, we're going to be looking at... Uh, lectures, videos, and then small sculptural assignments, weekly assignments. So you will have to be checking in your email um, on a daily basis. Let's try to stick with that commitment of our morning class, of our evening class, whatever lecture and studio hour you had um, in order for us to uh, stay a little bit in the course. I know that our lives have been altered and that everybody has different levels of responsibility with your with your loved ones with your family um a lot of you were working few jobs a lot of you live with your parents with your partners and so everything's shifted um but we're going to take this opportunity to um think creatively right a lot of a part of our 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 sculpture class was to step back away from ourselves uh question uh, the idea of the self um, therefore, we begin to question mm, the identity of a larger society, of larger economic systems, of larger social systems, right? And uh, we were trying to uh, understand ourselves, our world, through a visual language, um, something that we're really good at as human beings, believe it or not. Uh, we really establish a sense of self, a sense of truth through visual codes, through material, um, through the creation of, of myths. Um, we could say that capitalism is a myth. We could say that socialism is a myth. We could say that our whole educational system is a myth, um, especially us at a community college. Um, we know the statistics of our dropout rates, of our success rates, and we know that a system desires to continue to create or produce a working class, right? One of my uh, favorite educators that um, talks about the role of education, and, and therefore I think education and art are very close aligned in understanding the world, he states, education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate the integration of the younger generation, which is you, into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity to it. Conformity to it, right? So that means uh, whatever nation you were born into, whatever community you were born into, uh, education will serve to um, legitimize that way of thinking, whether it's fundamentally religious or secular, or if it's about communism, capitalism, socialism, um, whatever it is that you're born into, education serves to bring you to conform to that system of thought or number two becomes the practice of freedom the means by which men and women and all people discover how to participate in the transformation of their world so as as a young generation you receive education either to question your surrounding uh, why is it that we don't have health care for all why is there income inequality why is it that we have to work so many hours just to get by or you could be more like, yeah, this is how it is. You know, we get weekends off and uh, and this is life. And we're going to get into that. And we did go and get into that a lot in the few in the first half of the semester. Um, so this video, right? I mean, I was giving what 40 minute lectures, 35 minutes with some videos and some photos, some slides, some discussions. Uh, we were taking 10 minutes to write on our sketchbooks. Um, we're going to try to kind of stick with that format a little bit, but this time, whenever you have a chance to sit down, dedicate an hour, two hours to this class. Um, and so maybe four or five hours a week, 
to this class in order to complete it. Um, it's very flexible. Um, our projects are flexible. Everybody has different uh, concerns and needs outside of sculpture. Um, and so uh, I want to make sure that we continue to communicate clearly one-on-one, uh, -on -one, right? Just shoot me an email. Let me know that you're still uh, dedicated to the class. Let me know that you're still in it. I've heard from half of you, right, about picking up your self-portraits and continued working at our home. So I hope to hear from the rest of you uh, today. Um, so this video, well, I'm going to go through what we've covered so far in class, right? I've been promising you a midterm quiz. We're way past the midterm. So I'm going to throw it in there somewhere towards the end. Don't worry. It's an open internet, open source quiz. Um, I just want to make sure that some of these artists and art movements are staying in there somewhere, right? Um, in order we, for us to reference them uh, when we uh, do our class critique. Um, and we still got to figure out how we're going to do that. I think we might do it through Canvas. Uh, we'll all share our works through Canvas and then uh, maybe take three, four pictures of your sculpture and uh, we'll comment and then I'll have one-on-one -on -one critique with each each student. All right, and so after I, I I'm going to talk about maybe eight, twelve minutes about what we've covered so far, just to like refresh ourselves, like get back into it. I know uh, the last few weeks we were kind of wobbling through, right? <laughs> but now uh, let's try to let's try to get back into it and. Um, and it's gonna it's gonna be fun. So uh, the projects are gonna be challenging, but I think um, I think uh, they're open ended enough so where we all could really um, add our own problem solving skills, right? And then I'll do a little bit a little demo of this week's project. When we started the class, right? I introduced the class uh, as a beginning sculpture. Um, and that it was not going to focus on developing technique or skill or even learning uh, the basics of a material or a process of fabrication, right? Beginning sculpture, um, a lot of you aren't art majors, so this is the first and only and last time you'll be taking uh, an art class. A lot of you are art majors, and so this is still a very good introduction to to what sculpture is, what sculpture means in contemporary society, and what it has meant for different societies uh, throughout history, right? It's not an art history class, but I think it's really important if we're going to study uh, art, if we're going to try to uh, articulate ourselves through a visual form, right, that we understand a little bit of the history of it. And so we started to think about different time periods in history where uh, the representation of the self through sculptural form shifted, right? And it's always shifting. And so uh, we were looking at the Dark Ages, we were looking at the Renaissance, we were looking at post-World War II, um, um, and then we're looking at uh, modernism and contemporary art, um, post-modernism, and what it means today to, to make sculpture about the self. Because I think ultimately... Um, Sculpture is about the self e e through the individualistic lens that allows us to see the world through a collective form um, and, and, and other ways, right? Um, so we started questioning aesthetics, um, the sense of beauty, uh, where does it come from? It, we were questioning if it was divine, if it was sacred, um, if it was part of our DNA to recognize beauty or if it's something that's imposed through the process of colonization uh, through imperialism uh, through dominance um, through seduction right we want to seduce uh, different cultures different people to to take up our own sense of beauty so that's still a very good question and i don't think we need to answer it but i think just contemplating that idea like what kind of music you listen to? What 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 um, what kind of clothes do you wear? How do we express ourselves as a society, right? And who determines what good art and what bad art is? I think I think that was a huge part of our of our discussions. Um, uh, 
do we leave it to higher institutions, right? Like uh, museums, galleries, um, the market, right? Commercialism to determine what beautiful is, what good, what bad is, right? Or do we look at uh, throughout history communities, um, underrepresented communities, communities in resistance for survival and the kind of art and culture they have created for themselves, right? And so we were really um, uh, looking at these different artists, uh, the languages that they come up with, and who determines what good art and what are bad art is. And so the effort was for us to become the historians of this time and place uh, through the process of a self-portrait. Um, and that was, uh, that was our longer project, right? We, we started with smaller projects. Uh, we did non-objective sculpture that had its roots through, through Plato, who believed that geometry was the purest, um, the closest thing to the divine, right? away from human clutter, human noise, human nonsense. Um, and so if we look at just the cosmos, the shapes of the stars, the flowers, and that we focused our sense of beauty into those elements that we would not be able to go wrong. And, uh, and during that process, we're looking at um, how do we represent the self, right? In a society, uh, that's already seems to be a bit obsessed with the self, uh, a bit narcissistic, um, especially with the selfie and social media. And we were talking about how we are kind of uh, sur uh, doing this self-surveillance type of thing where, where we're constantly looking at ourselves through an outside lens, right? And we're shaping the idea of ourselves through that lens, right? Um, we don't know, we're not trying to put a moral um, value to it. We're not saying it's wrong or it's bad or, you know, or society is ill. We're just trying to look at who we are now and, and, and how we're existing in, in a contemporary society and how we're representing the self through sculptural form, through art, through culture, through dance, through music, through the body, right? And, and the selfie is a big manifestation of of how we think of ourselves. And so we traveled back to uh, post-World War II. Alberto Giacometti was a Swiss artist. Um, and we talked a little bit about what was going on in, in, in after World War II. Um, we were thinking about the moving image and the distribution of the moving image of the photograph and how that kind of shifted uh, the consciousness of the masses, right? When we were able to witness all these machines, these these machines of war, these machines of terror, um, kind of uh, creating this this level of surf suffering that we we never really saw before um, through our screens, through through the projected image. Um, I mean, uh, bodies being piled up in mass graves, the dropping of the atomic bomb where in seconds, uh, hundreds of thousands of women, children, and civilians uh, were wiped out. Um, and so before that, I think the European nations had a sense of superiority, had a sense of, um, of a culture that was on top of, uh, of that thing called aesthetics, right? Uh, they saw themselves as... Uh, as uh, civilized, as developed, as as basically Western society as the front of human evolution. And so they needed to create this narrative in order to justify genocide, in order to justify the whole process of colonization, right? Uh, to impose their sense of beauty to towards the rest of the world. But what happened in World War II is that, that the artists and intellectuals were just uh, a little bit um, left at a moral crisis. They started to see the self, uh, a human's uh, ability to create such destruction, they started to see the self as, as, um, as this empty void, um, fragile, um, nervous, uh, in shock, um, stripped of any real meaning, right? Um, 
isolated. Um, no cultural value, right? And so Alberto Giacometti, uh, with this great ability to draw and um, and create sculpture, began to to create these elongated stick figures, basically just stick figures. And we, you know, we had a discussion in class like who who can make these stick figures, and a lot of folks uh, were confident enough to raise their hand. Um, but what kind of meaning? Uh, do we do, do was Alberto Giacometti what kind what kind of message what kind of emotional tone was he trying to to express here in a society that pretty much lost its moral or never had a moral uh, compass right um, uh, what 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 was going on and so part part of uh, where they located his his thought it was uh, this it was called existentialism right where where man was essentially alone where there's no real divine intervention, there's no uh, destiny or fate, um, that man is left to its own ruins, we're left to our own need to survive, much like roadkill on the side of the road. Um, and so yes, it was very depressing uh, view of the world um, that Alberto Giacometti and his contemporaries were we're trying to express at this time. And so we're jumping off from like, well, in, in the Renaissance, we were depicting the self as godlike, right? We were we were powerful, we were creative, we were innovative, we were we were basing our thought on science, on, on technological innovations, right? And just the ability to to carve into this hard marble rock. How is it that we jump from something like a like a, a David of Michelangelo to a, a kind of fragile stick figure of, of what is Alberto Giacometti? Um, and you see in his paintings as well uh, the, this kind of nervous, fragile depiction of the self of humanity, where there's no real heroic pose, there's no famous general, no famous pharaoh or or king. Um, it's just a, a, a figure stripped of any cultural uh, um, meaning, right? Meaning that there's, there's, there's no clothes, there's no time period. Um, uh, it's made almost out of a, a, a thick mud. So let's think about the emotional qualities, the emotional tone that the texture also brings. The walking man, where is he going? Does he have a place to go? And so existentialism had these two sides to it, right? One was saying that let's just, it's almost like fatalism, like we don't have any real um, control over our own destiny. Uh, God is not with us. We're alone. We're empty. We're lonely and we're suffering. We're, we're, we're destined to suffer. And on the other side, it's, it's more like, hey, we are free. We're not tied to a god we're not tied to a destiny we're not tied to a predicted future right we are actually in control of our of our environment of our society we can shape reality the way we want to see it right and so in in one sense it was empowering uh to think about existentialism as as, as a way of going about in the world right in the way that we actually can can control our, our future, we can shape our society and, and our and our world the way we we wish. Another artist that we're looking at was Magdalena Magdalena Abakanowitz Abakanowitz. All right, I gotta say that right, Abakanowitz. And so she was pretty much making art during the same period. She was also from that generation. She was she was a Polish artist. Nazi Germany took over Poland for a while, and they were defeated. Then then the the Soviet Union uh, kind of took took control and established a communism, right? And so her growing up, her as an art student, she was uh, forced to create art uh, in the style of the social realist. The social realist were um, kind of like sanctioned by the state, by the communist state, to create art that represented the working class as heroes, that represented more of a collective um, collaboration between society, right? Um, and so um, 
at this time she uh, she uh, was trying to use humble materials also thinking about the human body also thinking about the self and so she used burlap um, certain types of resin to create these these uh, kind of empty shells or a cocoon or um, or a shedding of skin of some kind and so and so uh, Magdalena compared to Alberto Giacometti has the same emotional quality but she she presented her her, her pieces kind of in, in groups right and um, each each sculpture was still very much uh, individuals but what is she saying right how, how how is she representing why is she representing the self in in this way as well in a crowd are they passive um, are they victims are are they just a uh, residue of something that was how how is how how do we represent ourselves in different time periods right and so what i want you to think about now that we're we're i'm kind of just going through the same uh, lectures that we went at the beginning of the semester just to get our foot back into the, the process of making art right the process of creating sculpture um we uh we jumped from from post-world war ii and we started just thinking about what's going on now uh how are different artists using different mediums to make a statement about the world right we also talked about the, the, the idea of the lottery of birth that suggests that, of course, our sense of self comes from the place we're born, um, the values, uh, and the teachings of our parents or of our immediate circles. And we kind of tend to uh, repeat what we're taught. We kind of tend to believe what we're, what we're taught at a very young age, um, because that's the sense of, of safety, of survival, of nurture. And so part of this class was to start thinking about the layers, the, 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 the complicated contradiction, contradicting layers of ourselves, right? Who are we? Um, why do we like certain things? Um, what defines us? What defines society, right? And so some of the artists that we looked over uh, was uh, Kara Walker. Uh, we looked at her um, her sugar piece, thinking about the history of sugar um, and what what that history uh, carries. Right, we're talking about child labor, slavery. We're talking about sugar as a as a commodity for 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 the the one percent wealthiest, right? And how that sparked that slave trade, right? To 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 continue to create uh, sugar for for a uh, European. Uh, consumer uh, block up there um, and we had discussions on that we talked about uh, a little bit about Ana Mandieta uh, the way she saw the self uh, the representation of, of the self through a, uh, through a female uh, lens through a female gaze kind of grabbing the the camera away from you know hundreds of years of, of male gaze of male representation of the female experience and kind of flipping it on it and and then uh, owning it right and we went over a lot of different uh, artists uh, that uh, that that were doing that right in the 60s and in the 70s uh, Anthony Gormley again I think the representation of the self is is, is always been with us, right? Uh, whether it's Richard Serra's huge, huge uh, sculptures, it's still very much about the self, the figure, our relationship to those huge structures that humans are able to build. We looked at the work of George Siegel. Um, again, these isolated kind of individual bodies uh walking around new york walking around huge crowds but still feeling this sense of solitude and so uh, i think right now with the COVID 19 and what's what's this huge pause that society is taking right now that the world is taking right now is a time for us to really think about about where we're going as a society what we're doing as students what we want to accomplish in our lives what um what is what what are the real things that create meaning for us right as as a family as a culture as communities of faith um 
and I think looking, understanding sculpture, under, understanding art allows us for us to, to see the world through different lenses. And so we don't necessarily have to like the art that we see, but I think um, being able to step into somebody else's eyes, somebody else's experience allows us to, to kind of comprehend a, a larger aspect of society, right? Um, and I think that uh, allows us to be more critical about our own beliefs and critical about how society is structured. Um, and I, and I, I do believe that this leads to greater emotional intelligence. It leads to greater problem solving, problem solving skills. And uh, I don't know if it leads to happiness. Um, we saw the work of Ron Muick, these hyper-realistic kind of depictions of the self, right? Uh, thinking about scale, if you uh, create these large human depictions, right, in a super realistic way, is it more intimate? Do you feel closer? Do you feel more separated to, to, to the emotional tone of those figures, right? And so these are some of the examples of how scale also Im impacts our response to sculpture. We looked at outsider artists. We saw, we, we, we kind of... Uh, Took a little video tour of, of this organization in Oakland called Creative Growth. We saw the work of Judith Scott, of Henry Dagger, and thinking about their experiences of the world, right, and how they express themselves. And so we we were questioning uh, who has the authority to really determine what value is, right? Who gives value to certain objects and 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 and. Um, and not value to other objects, right? There is a point graffiti art was just kind of like gangster street, kind of um, youth straggling, skater culture, hobo culture, right? And who would ever pay attention to that kind of work uh, until it, it gained traction, right? And we looked at the mission school. Uh, we look at Margaret's and Barry McGee's work. We looked at... Um, uh, the artist Blue, a little bit of Banksy, um, just to think about how art it can exist outside, does exist really outside museums and galleries and institutions, right? We're kind of questioning the role of institutions and the role of, of, of self-taught artists or artists that work outside of the gallery or museum um, cube. Um, and so we're trying to appreciate all these different ways of thinking about art right outside of the pedestal in a gallery with the light on it. Um, we looked at the work of Theaster Gates, uh, transforming uh, abandoned houses, crack houses in the south side of Chicago, uh, the effects of redlining. We discussed what redlining was and how that transforms the identity of a community, of a neighborhood, and therefore you we adopt that identity for ourselves and so theaster gates as a potter uh realized where his dad was a roofer so so he kind of understood uh construction materials roofing materials tar remodeling materials right and so he started gutting these old houses he started with the studio and transformed it into a place of performance of reading um events of uh, movie nights and so it became kind of like a cultural hub and it started creating some energy right around this house and so the house in itself became the art piece um, and the one house turned into four turned into six they transformed an abandoned bank into an artist residency a library and so we're trying we're, we're now seeing how art um, is actually about uh, creating actual um, significant change in, in society rather than just uh, an object to be looked at from a distance, right? Now the body is experiencing the work, right? And it's in larger collaboration with city planners, with developers, with politicians, with um, funders, uh, um, with community cultural workers, right? Um, so it becomes like this huge extended collaboration between a lot of players uh, we looked at the work of Ai Weiwei from China um, in response to the Cultural Revolution. We talked about a little bit of what the Cultural Revolution was in China, uh, the desire to step into the new world and modern world, right, by destroying your past, 
by destroying um, uh, faith or religion or by destroying a superstition, right? Um, and so we were talking about how an artist, um, just by creating subtle commentary, could actually be a threat to these larger systems of power, right? Um, he was imprisoned, he was exiled, his studio was destroyed. And so we, we, we talked about how, how an artist can can actually be a threat. Um, and so Ai Weiwei's work, you know, he was talking about um, the different cover-ups of the Chinese government when, when it came to uh, uh, these government contracts to build all these high towers and, and them skipping um, regulations, uh, safety regulations to be more efficient in their work, I suppose. And how one of those buildings crumbled, killed hundreds, uh, I think thousands of, of children, and the Chinese government tried to cover it up. And so Ai Weiwei created these, these installations that kind of exposed all these different uh, truths from, from the Chinese government. And so that didn't sit well um, from the backpacks, right? The installation of the backpacks through the uh, rebar. Um, and then also talking about the Syrian uh, refugee crisis right and the responsibility that certain european nations had uh, um, to provide uh, safety and shelter and sanctuary for 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 these families that were fleeing war um then we jumped to uh more of a participatory sculpture right uh, we saw the swings of um, hamilton and in the middle of a large city, you enter into a warehouse and you see these beautiful swings, right? Uh, art um, um, that requires the participation of the public. Um, I'm sure I missed a, a lot of different uh, artists uh, that we've been talking about. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but I think it was it was good to kind of go through. Um, review a little bit of, of what what we've been learning in class and um, and how you're able to to uh, create a visual language in your self portraits right what's the story that you're telling what's the story of your family uh, if you're not Yokut indigenous Native American you came from somewhere you came from a larger rich story right either from from the you know the dust bow migration uh or from 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 the south a lot of folks came out here to bakersfield to oakland to to los angeles to work in the in the shipping right and and and, and the um and the docks uh our, our families came to work the farms right uh to pick lettuce and tomatoes um and so a lot of you have different different rich stories that we need to investigate. Uh, it doesn't define who we are, but it helps us to think about our ancestors and where and where we might be headed. Um, and that brings us to this week's project um, that we're going to do a little demo. Um, it's going to be really easy, um, and we're basically going to. Uh, create uh, a small figurine and we're going to think about um, social distancing and what that means for you and your family and yourself and I'm going to do a demo we're going to use house uh, materials we're going to use um, flour for paper mache uh, aluminum foil and tape I hope you guys got tape and newspaper right um, some paint and uh, the idea is to experiment with with site specific sculpture meaning that that it's going to change in meaning depending on where you put the sculpture once it's complete and so you'll you're going to put it in different places when you take a walk in your house uh, you know surrounded by different things in a puddle and we're going to talk a little bit about about um, how to go about that in this next video. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break like we always did. I'm going to edit it. All right, back in 10.